So in this section, we're going to see a little bit of what we were just talking about with Anzit and Bardia. Um, Bardia, in this kind of reinterpretation of the story, he comes down to the mines to check on everybody and to see how things are going. Um, in our world of the Society of Gloam, instead of going backwards, we set it in the year million, which is way far in the future. Right, okay. And so part of our story is that the world as we know it has kind of collapsed and is defunct. And Trom is kind of rebuilding a society out of the ashes of modern civilization. Mm. Yeah, and so part of that means the miners, when they're mining, they're in kind of this toxic waste soup down there. Mm. And so you see, and you can kind of see as we start, there's like a pile of dancers. Yes. And you see them start to get sicker and sicker. And so that's kind yes. of where we find them at this point in the story. Okay, pause. So I was curious why Ansett is going back to the miners and then going with Bardia and then going back. She keeps pulling back to the miners. Yeah, so in this section, she's begging Bardia to do something about the fact that everybody's starting to get sick. Oh, I see. And so she kind of is saying to him here, hey, you've got the king's ear, you know, you're the captain of the guard we're really suffering and like you need mm -hmm. to do something and bardia is conflicted because he loves his wife he cares right. about the people but he also knows that trom is not very compassionate no. so that's where <laughs> they're kind of struggling in this moment and stage right is the exit from the mines yes so that's why she keeps kind of pulling him that way of hey take us towards the exit okay. let us out okay Okay, pause. So can you tell us a little bit about this part, Karen? I know in the <clears throat> book it happens differently, but this kind of gets to the same point of Psyche coming in. Right, so Psyche being compassionate and loving, she, when the people get sick, I mean, there's this famine that's come upon the land and the people are sick and she goes out and just to help. But it turns out that in some way she's providing healing mm -hmm. for the people. So that's what's happening here. She comes in and the sick people are holding on to her and kind of worshiping her ultimately as a goddess, mm -hmm. which she isn't. I mean, she's a human being. I, I could be wrong, but I think of it as um, when Jesus was healing people, other people could heal like his disciples yeah. you know had the power to heal through through the holy spirit and mm -hmm. so i see her as ministering the gospel in a way yeah. and in healing and providing healing but she ultimately gets in trouble for that yeah yeah that's such a wonderful insight thank you for sharing that and so even though till we have faces <clears throat> lewis gets us there in a different way we end up with that same kind of key point of psyche's mm -hmm. character so thank yeah. you for that okay pause so right here you're gonna see one of the transitions um and actually mm -hmm. in this show there's not a blackout at all except at the very mm -hmm. beginning and the very very end even intermission as i'm sure you remember the curtain stays open the set stays on stage there's like oh. twinkly lights that's okay i don't remember it because i was so involved talking to my students yeah, and my niece and other people i love it yeah <laughs> No, and that's totally fine. So, yeah, we kind of wanted to create this moment where the world of Gloam existed and we never turned the lights out on it. And I okay. think, you know, that's highly influenced from film and cinematography. Yes. 
And I think for us as a company, kind of trying to create these sequences was one of the hardest parts of the show. Yeah, I bet. You know, and honestly, probably something we'll still work on as we go into mm-hmm. a new run of it because mm-hmm. trying to make it logical that they're transitioning to a mm-hmm. new part of the scene mm-hmm. without a blackout and a reset. Mm-hmm. It's fun, but it's a lot harder to do than I originally had thought. Oh, okay. And But you did it well, partly with the... Um, the structures, like I call it the coat rack. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if it's coat rack, yeah. but, uh, and then the, the stair case yeah. and all those kinds of things helped a lot with transitions. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Pause. So are they, the, the people are coming to Trom to get help, right? Because of the famine and the yeah. sickness and everything. That's exactly it. It's that okay. scene in the Till We Have Faces where they kind of pound on the gates mm-hmm. um, and they're they're going, hey, you know, mm-hmm. we have all these problems. And actually, the section that we're going into, which we're not going to watch today, but the dancers actually took the lines of the villagers in the book and improv based off of those lines. Oh, that's you great. Know, one of them was corn, corn, give us corn. <laughs> you know, so that's in there. And uh-huh. one was um, something about the king being barren, and it's something to the effect of the king of Foz has 12 sons, and, you yes. know, barren king, barren land. Yes. So, yeah, all of those lines were used to create the movement. And he's not, the king is not barren due, due to not having children. He just won't have a son. And yeah. that's their big... That's his problem. I mean, he's so upset about that, having all these daughters. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> so he's barren in terms of having a successor, a son. Yeah, that's such a good point and really shows, I think, the devaluing of the women in the story. Yes, which yes. Which is a strong point that I think, um, you know, Joy brings across, Lewis's wife, mm-hmm. because she was an integral part of helping to write the story. I yes. think that female voice comes across of mm-hmm. the feeling of, you know, women sometimes feeling devalued to the point Mm -hmm. of, you know, you're useless without having kind of that male leader. And I think that point comes across in a lot of this section. Right. And then a rule has the added uh, problem. Uh, You know, she's a woman and the king doesn't love his women, but she's also considered ugly. And so just, it's like a double whammy for her. Yeah, that's so true. And really speaks to that, that cultural... Mm -hmm. Kind of feeling that, I think as women, sometimes, yeah, if we can't have power, we can at least influence through our beauty and our charm, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. O'Rule has neither. So thank you for that. That's Mm -hmm. a good insight. Mm -hmm. Okay, pause. So you can't see it too well on film, but a fun little Easter egg is that Trom is actually throwing real dehydrated corn onto the stage. Oh, my goodness. And there's one kernel per dancer, and they are finding them, and they are eating them right there <laughs> live. And so he kind of, they say, corn, corn, give us corn, and he very generously gives them one kernel each. Oh, nice. Yeah. And um, I love this part because Jonathan has a great time with it, and sometimes he says he'll actually, like, target some of the dancers and purposefully try to throw it on his coworkers, which they, you know, they're great. They're, like, yeah, yeah, a big family. So that part of it is entertaining. So if you oh, watch it again live, you can be looking to see where Jonathan is aiming the corn. Oh. <laughs> and then the visual here, I think, really shows a rule kind of coming into mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, her role as the heir to the throne. And so we see Trom kind of on this upper layer. <clears throat> we see a rule mm-hmm. in the middle and then Bardia on her left-hand side. Um, so you can see him and then the, the peasants or the miners mm-hmm. on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then in that left corner of the stage, um, there's like a little vignette happening that's, it's not crucial to the story, which is why we put it in the background. But Psyche is attending to the fox who has become gravely ill with the plague. Yes, I think I did <clears throat> notice that on one of my later viewings of this. Yeah. Um, I also just want to throw this in. So I had to reread the other day the first part of the book because when I teach the story, I can only focus on so many things because I, I don't spend, I spent only two weeks on it or something. And so I reread part of the beginning, uh, especially Redeval and, um, and then when people get sick, and I just didn't remember, but a rule ends up um, 
working with the king in the pillar room, yeah. I had totally forgotten that, which because the um, because Bardia was sick, yeah. and so she's basically trained yeah. to be queen. Also, she doesn't just walk into it when he dot when the king dies. Yeah. She's actually in the pillar room, and she says that was one of the best times with her father, the king, that he was not cruel to her. Um, and he actually almost treated her on the same level because she did a good job. But I, I thought, okay, so that helps as we look at this scene, the different layers. And as you said, she's becoming, she will be the queen. And so she's yeah. right under the king. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a great segue to where we're going in the next sequence. And we're going to actually watch a little bit of that in a second. Um, it gave us a great high value dance moment for Sarah Clark, who plays O'Rule. She has this really dramatic, beautiful solo that yes. she does in the pillar room. Um, and it, that's kind of while the fox and Bardia end up being sick and are on the side. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we're going there next. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm-hmm. 